Hello and welcome to the Amber Spycast, your one-stop shop for all things His Dark Materials. Your Dark Materialists, ugh. your Dark Materialists are myself, Alaric. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very excited that we finally got to this moment. We're going to be talking about the show on HBO here in the States, but BBC there in the UK. And uh, I'm going to throw it to Joanna, who has no doesn't have to read a recap today. How do you feel about that? <laughs> I don't know what to do at all, guys. I have no idea what to do. I feel I feel like empty inside. But <laughs> super, super excited. Super excited to talk about this show. Watching it and having it not be the movie was just dreamy. Yeah. And my other co-host <laughs> is Travis. That segue was gorgeous. Hey, everybody. Uh, it's me. Uh, yeah, so it's weird coming into the show not having done any reading. Like, I feel like I need to talk about some kind of book or something. Uh, I'm reading Thor comics when I'm not doing this. So, uh, yeah, it's the show was awesome. I watched it, like, three times, and I'm super excited. Um, from From my perspective, spot on. Everything was spot on. What about you guys? Yeah, I think I would go. I, I would. I would agree. I think that it's. You you could say it's both very true to the source material and also is expanding on it a little bit uh -huh. um, because we're getting not a single. You know, Golden Compass was a single character's perspective for the most part, and we're getting to see like in Azriel's lab in the north. Mm -hmm. You know, which we never got to see. Um, we get to see Egyptians in their own world, in their own life, you know, doing their own things, which we never really got to see. Lyra was always a part of it. She was always mm -hmm. in it, in the mix. So we got to see their their lives being lived. I, I like how they're expanding it. And even, even Asriel, his like, you know, you get to see a little bit further into Lyra and Asriel's relationship, which is nice because when he's out of Lyra's either out of the room that Lyra's in, we don't know what he's doing, but we kind of get to see a little bit more. I, I like the, the very subtle, it's not so overt and blatant, but nice little expansions on the material. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was, I was taken from the get go, like from the, from the dreamy opening and they just had, you know, just the right amount of words. It wasn't the like 10 minute ruin everything from the movie opening. It was, mm -hmm just enough so you had a little bit of context yep. and then they go into the great you know the, the very first scene where where um Azrael is going through the flood to go and drop off baby lyra um and baby lyra oh mm -hmm. my gosh so cute adorable and, oh so my cute. goodness and yeah. you know what was cuter two pan. words baby pan baby pan baby pan what yes i paused it mm -hmm. i was just like i just need to look at your little face for like two seconds yep. yeah Yep. I wanted to hear baby pan voice. Yes. That was the only thing that would have made it better was baby pan voice. Absolutely. Was, that would have been amazing. Yeah. yeah. Pan was just super cute. But so the, what was... the flood and the uh, yeah. little um, helicopter thing. So that's, that's two elements that um, from my perspective, I think uh, are new to us. Um, I think they're, um, from everything that I'm reading from uh, folks on the Twitters and everything, this is an insert from one of the sequels. It's a flashback um, that's inserted in, uh, I I don't know which one. I think but, it's the, uh, it's Book of Dust, the first okay. book, which is, uh, is that uh, La Belle Sauvage, La Belle Sauvage, the first one? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Secret Commonwealth is the newest book, which is Lyra post the, the trilogy that we're reading mm -hmm. and La Belle Sauvage is her as a baby. Okay. And so we did okay. get to see a little piece of it. It's almost like an appendix appendices for the series. So do we know about the flood? Like, well, I, no. we haven't already, I'm not going to jump. We've already. Yeah. yeah. We'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. But, and then also like the little helicopter thingy. We like remarked there... on it right away. We were like, Oh, that's just like a regular helicopter. Yeah. It's not, yeah. It looks like a mash helicopter or something. Right. Right. It's very straightforward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, we see in present day, everything has gone, you know, full steampunk, full dirigible, you know, really, really different technology and in, in whatever, what, 12 years, is that what it said? 12 years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, he just like kind of comes in and, uh, take the baby. Uh, she needs to be protected. She's, she's in danger outside. And, and what was it? I demand, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm 
invoking scholastic sanctuary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's pretty neat. Yeah. So clearly she's not safe. Like he believes that she's not safe or she's in danger. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. But yeah. The master just... doesn't really, he doesn't really want to take her. You know, well, and why you would know. you? No, he holds her there. like, he might as well have been holding her like this, like just, <laughs> you know, kind of up and out. Like, what is this thing? Like he looked like he did not want to have that baby at all. And all she did was smile at him. It was the cutest thing ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, shout out to Clark Peters uh, as the the master. I thought that was, you know, I, I love him and I wasn't sure about him in this role, but perfect. Yeah. Oh, Loved yeah. Him. yeah. He's gone from the greatest cop in Baltimore to now the, the master. And, yeah. Uh, I'm cool with that. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Great voice. Oh, yeah. uh, and we can weigh in on McAvoy, I guess, later, but we get a little, he, he does have a very frantic energy in this scene. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, not, he's not stoic. He's, 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 he's nervous. He's desperate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which but says his... two things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That one, that he cares about Lyra, right? Mm-hmm. You know, like he's actually invested in Lyra. And two, something's going down. Mm-hmm. So um, the opening titles, what did you think about the opening titles? Gorgeous. Yeah. Especially when it starts to sandwich together. Yes. I love that part. Which is subtle. Yes. But wow. That was was my favorite part. Yeah, that was my favorite part, too. Uh, I said to to my daughter that it reminded me of uh, what a Doctor Who opening should be if they had the money. You know? (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, the, the the credit, the house that, you know, the credit house or whatever that all they do is opening credits. They uh, they made their money on this one. Absolutely. Just yeah. the right amount of dusty. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just well, the, the right d- amount of like Game of Thronesy. Yeah. Just, <laughs> just a little bit. The dust forming the bone was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. we're all made of it, you know, or whatever. I like mm-hmm. that little touch. Mm-hmm. It's it was it was uh yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, and then we we get to see Lord Azriel's uh, his northern um, Arctic lab, mm-hmm. which is pretty pretty extensive. He's out in he's out in the elements. He's clearly this must be his. I, I was right away. I was like I was like photograms. You know, <laughs> he's photographs. He's taking them. Where's the emulsion? Uh, so I was. It was kind of exciting to see that little that little moment. Uh, and we got to see Thorold already. We do. Who's yep. are, by the way already exasperated? <laughs> yes, I was thinking that. Day I was one. Like, you look just like a just like a housewife, just like, oh, you know, she, he looks so like ready to be done. Yeah. Are it's your hands fun. clean, Thorold? Are, are your <laughs> hands clean? And then he starts rubbing his hands. Like, like, yeah. yeah, they're clean. They're clean. <laughs> uh, that that was that was good. Uh, and then, and then... the um, Aurora, you could you. I think for us because we we knew what was coming. I could see, you know, the outlines of Sitagazi in mm-hmm. the Aurora. Uh, it was that that was neat. That was really a neat touch. And uh, we get to go into the cooler and see the head too. The frozen head comes out. Stanislaus. Yeah. So are, are we going to do spoilers? Are we going to do books? Are we doing book spoilers in here? Um, I guess it, as long as it sticks within the episode, I don't see why. I don't see why not. Okay, because my I guess we're jumping around a little bit. I mean, my thought is we're in season three of our show, so and we've just finished the subtle knife, so we can kind of d- talk about up to that. Mm-hmm. So my thought now I want to know whose head was that? Right. Uh, it's got to be just a random Tartar head, right? I guess. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, it's something I didn't get reading the book was how. Um, distorted i guess you know the view of the the of the the face would be yeah the so, ice was dirty right it was, yeah that was revealed when he pulls it out for, in, at the school they're all like well i mean you know i it's a little dirty but i guess it could be him but there's really even the person looking at it wasn't like that's him mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that was cool right uh and then we get our first um image of lyra as a as a 12 year old Mm-hmm. Uh, racing, um, I guess, who is she racing? Roger? Roger. Roger. Yeah, mm-hmm. racing racing Roger for the first time and both their demons. Roger's mm-hmm. demon was Ratter, I believe. Yep. Which is a uh, no. Tony, Tony that Macario's. Is, that is Bobby's. That is Bobby's. Bobby's. Not, not, yes. Oh, yeah. that's Bobby's, Bobby's was Ratter. Bobby Costa yeah. was Ratter. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bobby is the one that they combined with Tony. Yeah. Yes. Again. Yes. Yeah, yep. again. 
I think it again. I think I'm. I know. I kind of understand that. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think Tony is such a great. It's such a great moment, and you don't have to necessarily know his backstory to be for it to be tragic. Right. Uh, but we'll we'll find out. He does have great taste in sweater vests, though. I'm just saying. <laughs> so many great, great sweater vests. There were some great sweater vests in this episode. <laughs> yeah. There really were. Every, you know, just sticking with costuming for a second. Outstanding. Like, I want every guy in this show's wardrobe. The suits on the Masters. The, um... The, cable, the uh, smart cable knit sweaters, uh, yes. the tucked, tucked in cable knit sweaters yes. that Asriel's wearing. Those are like, sharp. Yeah. And the tie. I'm like, this whole this whole show is my look. This mm-hmm. is what I want. Mm-hmm. You know, this is happening. This is I'm gonna I'm gonna cosplay next year as one of these guys. So, what was your initial reaction to Daphne Keene as Lyra? I, I, th- there was a second after when Pan says starts to read the rules to her starts to tell her the rules and she does this thing with her face that like brought me in right away mm-hmm. like she mm-hmm. just does this little thing with her face like <laughs> it's like you're you're lyra yeah she she was lyra for me i see and i know exactly what you're talking about and that was exactly the moment i was like oh my god this is yep she was she i i already knew or thought she'd be perfect mm-hmm. and that's all she had to do and i was like sold yep yeah, good voice, good look. Um, she's. Uh, it was fun to see her running through the college, and everyone's like, "Lyra, Lyra, mm-hmm. Lyra!" Yelling her name, and she wouldn't listen. She's just running through everybody, running ramshod through the college. Uh, so she's and and she's a, a little grubby. Mm-hmm. You know, her clothes are a little grubby. She's uh, and you know, we we get right to the crypts right away too, which is kind of fun. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, which I was like, when, are they going to steal? Are we gonna, are we going to get to see like spirits already? Like, are we going to get all see all that? They're going to steal the with the coins, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but no, we didn't get to see. It. Sadly, we didn't get to see any ghosts. Yeah, we uh, yeah. just get a little bit of booze as she's running towards the crypts. She though. spit that right out. She did. <laughs> it was kind of a funny cut too. It was like a real smash cut where she's uh-huh. like, Psh, and they put it right away to another scene. That was really that was great. I love that scene, too, just because she runs when she runs through Jordan College. Like, it, I, I mean, it was everything in my mind's eye that Jordan College would and should be. Like, mm-hmm. I, it just was exactly, you know, not quite Hogwarty, not quite like real Oxfordy, And yeah. they just hit it. They just hit it. And they did a really nice job with the librarian. Mm-hmm. I think I liked I liked I just like the fact that he sort of had this, you know, you got to see that mentor teacher relationship and how she often would abuse that relationship. And I, I liked it. I thought he was dear. Yeah. Where he else have I seen him? For her. Yeah. It's clear. Yeah. You know, it's I'm not sure where, where I had seen him before. I know I've seen him other places to the internets. I have it open here. Um, but I don't know what his character's name. Charles. Charles. Dead air. I know. Um, <laughs> we're not. Do, I'm do, not do, editing do, this do, out. Do, 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 do. Um, yeah, let's just leave it. Leave, leave, leave all this dead air. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to it. Um, Put crickets but he, in. He, but he was, yeah, he was, he was lovely, and yeah, there was a real, there was a nice relationship there, and she knew exactly what to do to kind of distract him mm-hmm. and to like, you know, so she could hide behind the door. Um, yeah, can was, you read this story to me? He's like, oh, oh that one? Like, it's his favorite story, you know, right? Yeah. 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 Of course he's going to say it. Mm-hmm. And he's totally teaching hardcore religion, too. Mm-hmm. There was, like, oh, yeah. full-out religion up on that board. Yeah. And, yeah. and I mean, it was like a, a cosmology. I mean, there was, like, mm-hmm. Earth and then Heaven and Hell in their own spheres. I was interested that Heaven and Hell are in the same sphere. Hmm. Oh, I didn't. I didn't notice that. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, I like that they do that because it's such the way they introduce this idea of the church and the influence it has is so beautifully subtle. Mm-hmm. Just sat on the board, just kind of, you know, the way that they're having this informal kind of teaching session versus some of the heavy handedness that came with the movie. Mm-hmm. So right. I was, it was really refreshing that they were that it seems from the start that they're allowing people to put some of those pieces together on their own instead of feeding it to them. Mm-hmm. 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 So. Thank you. <laughs> oh, and um, Charles is uh, played by Ian Gelder, 
And I know what what I know him from is uh, is Game of Thrones. He's Kevin Lannister. Yes. And uh, also from um, Torchwood. Um, so he, he's got yeah, some, he, he's, he's apparently got also some, on. Some cred. Uh, yeah, he's apparently also on, on EastEnders a lot. Okay, there you go. Uh, uh, so we get to see. Um, what do you think of the Egyptian seeing the Egyptians lives and oh. what's going on with the, uh, the coming of age and the, uh, they each give a little bit of silver mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. him to make and, and when his, his demon settles was a very, again, very carefully talking about how demons settle without slapping you in the face with it mm-hmm. and building it into the plot and the story. That was a really nice a ritual, a ritual. Yeah. Yeah. Like a chant and like singing. Like a coming and... of age thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. I, I was... love that. Yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was this, beautiful. This is one of the scenes that I saw some criticism online. Of course, there's criticism for everything. Yeah. Uh, gr- grumpy people everywhere. That there weren't enough demons visible in this scene. Um, and to, to that I say, first of all, most of them are birds. Yep. Mm-hmm. For the Egyptians. So if you see some of the wide shots, and I was watching for it, there's birds flapping around all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, the people are like kind of packed into that little space. So how are you going to be able to see all the demons, demons anyway? Right. Did you feel that that was something that was missing? Did you feel there weren't enough critters wandering around in every scene? I'd say in the close up, like in the shots when you kind of saw them all close together. I thought that, too. I was like, wow, I don't really see any demons. Where is everybody? Yeah. Right. But as soon as they pulled back, I mean, you could see. I mean, there were birds flying everywhere, although I didn't see any other demons besides birds. So I don't, I, you know, I was looking, but I didn't quite catch any. Maybe others did. I, mean, I figure scene. that there were some in pockets, some running around, you know, mm-hmm. like they just aren't visible. Well, like, you've established not... that they exist and everyone has one. I don't right. know that you have to show everybody's demon right. every every minute of the, of the show. Mm-hmm. It's what's, what, and it's funny because I'm the one who complained about it in the movie that, you know, I, that I felt that there weren't enough demons um, but in this, it didn't feel like there was an absence. I think because this world is a lot more, was a lot more populated than the movie was. The, um, there were, there were a lot more background people. Mm-hmm. It's not as polished. I mean, it's very polished, but it is not, it doesn't have a patina of like CG yeah. and green mm-hmm. screen and blue screen. You really feel like you're on location. Mm-hmm. Um, and you feel like you're in a real warehouse full of people it's not you know a, a room in atlanta with mm-hmm. a big green curtain in the background they're all kind of packed into that space there's not sort of this weird digital you know it feels like we're looking at real people yeah uh, and there, there was something about the movie that felt sort of false and there were so many of them mm-hmm. i mean there were lots of egyptians there and and what i i felt from that was it didn't even feel like that was all of them you know that was everyone mm-hmm. who could be there now right Right. It, it, it was really, it, it really felt like a lived in world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I had written down in my notes when I was watching, like they did it right. Mm-hmm. Like they did this right. You got to see community. You got to see, you know, tradition. You mm-hmm. got to see the, I loved how they did it here where the Egyptians were, were literally just piecemeal together a community. It wasn't mm-hmm. a specific like ethnicity. It wasn't a specific, you know, it was it was everyone and anybody was mm-hmm. like embraced in this in this culture mm-hmm. and i really really i really love that a so lot. did i and that raised like again like so many world building questions for me how you know in, in the in the book um actually you know it, it it raised a slightly larger question because in the book um there's there's actually a a point where lyra's you know, talks about uh, in Subtle Knife, where she she talks about like the multi ethnic world that she's in in um, Will's world. You know, mm-hmm. like she sees some people who are um, Mus- Muscovy and uh, you know some Africans and and folks like that, like all on the same street. Where what I was taking from that was that's not how things typically went in her world. Mm-hmm. And then you know, in both in the movie and in the books, the the Egyptians were pretty much a one to one analog for you know the the Romani. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know a, a distinct ethnicity. Mm-hmm. And then in 
this series, though, they are, like you said, you know, like a patchwork of all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And that just raises the question for me, you know, what are the Egyptians in this world? You know, because they had distinct accents. Mm -hmm. You know, are they refugees from different things? Are they connected to that flood that we saw earlier? Um, you know, how how did they come to be in in this world? Like there there's got to be. A, but then they they they've developed their own traditions and everything else. So because um, I mean, they and they talk about you know specifically the the, the Egyptian way. You know, how did this happen? I, I and, and to me, just the fact that there's a that this inspires so many questions in me made me love this more. Yeah, mm. it's I think economics in a way. Like you can almost see that economics put them to where, where they are. They're mobile. They're on boats. Mm -hmm. They don't have roots necessarily um, on the ground, but their community is their roots, mm -hmm. uh, and they sort of find each other. And I don't know that you have to be from anywhere or be a specific kind of person to be Egyptian. Yeah, not, and they, in, not and they, in the show. Right, yeah. and they and they state that, like they mm -hmm. actually state that, like in the, when he gives his little like kind of speech. I think it's Benjamin Deruder is the one that gives a little speech. Mm -hmm. It's like we are all outcasts together. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And so like, and and that to me, you know, and they look down on us or they think we're this, but we know that we're this. Right. And right. so I th so I think you're right, Alec. I think it seems like it's more of a like almost like a class kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so, so, yeah, that just raised the question, you know, where would that, uh, you've got your standard lower class folks, but then you've got, uh, you know, these guys, how do they drift, find their way into the Egyptians? It's mm -hmm. just something I, I, I would love to see addressed, but I don't need it to be addressed. I just love that the question's there and that they've created the infrastructure for the questions. Yeah, and we're going to meet so many more Egyptians further mm -hmm. upriver in different communities, and they're going to have, there's a structure yeah. to their society. It's pretty, yeah, that mm -hmm. is interesting. So um, Tony, Tony Costa gets to, not Tony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tony Costa mm -hmm. uh, gets his, his bird settles on a hawk, or his, his demon settles on a hawk. And Billy is a little bit, seems to be a little bummed out, maybe. That he's going to yeah. miss miss out on time with his brother now. His brother's now a man, so he can't really hang out with him anymore, and he's a little despondent, and wanders off by himself. And sadly, he oh. gets he gets gobbled. But the fox, I know, so oh, creepy, super creepy. Oh, and and his squirrel demon, or his demon was a squirrel, and mm -hmm. couldn't resist. She couldn't resist approaching the fox. I thought it was in just that little moment. I was like, mm -hmm. "Ooh, what is what kind of power does this fox have over demons?" Mm -hmm. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. So he gets snatched, or, or she, yeah, he gets snatched, and um, we jump back to Azrael coming to the college. Mm -hmm. uh, this scene played out a little differently. Um, Lyra's outside of a window for the first part of it. And she's uh, watching much of the what goes on as far as the poisoning concern from the window. Uh, and she has to jump in the window to stop him from drinking it, which I thought was kind of fun. And then she doesn't get stuck in a wardrobe, really. She gets stuck in like a, a window seat. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and she's like looking through the window seat. So interesting little small change there. But I think that that was pretty effective. I did like when he knocked over the... Um, the bottle of Toke is like and it shat, the way it shattered and the way that it was shot. I really, I really appreciated that. Mm -hmm. He had um, almost a playful air when he did that. You know, yeah, he did. He did. It was like, oops, you know, like, right. uh, you know, uh, I guess, guess no one's going to drink this anymore. Yeah. Uh -huh. it, was, it was a little bit playful. He does grab her arm though. The same way it happens <sighs> in the book. Yeah. Exactly but he also, the, same did, did he uh, the dialogue is the same too. too. In the book? What's that? Oh, yeah. Did he slam her head into the table in the book too? He was really rough with her. Yeah. Yeah, I remember he like yanked her, but mm -hmm. here he like had her in that hold and yeah. like gosh. No, but he, yeah, the dialogue was the exact same. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And I love that he realizes it's her and he still doesn't let her go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like you know, he has this like a 12 year old in this like weird headlock arm and she's, you know, um, and he is he, I mean, he says I'll like I'll kill you first or whatever. Like you know what I mean? Like she's like, let me go, break and he's arm. like, I'll, yeah, he's like, I'll break your arm first before I'll like tell me what you're doing. Um, 
and I, I really love that they established he, you know, I, I don't know when we're going to talk about James McAvoy. I'm trying to keep my fangirling under control. Now, now's now's a fine. I think we're here. Think jump, we're here. Jump in. Okay. So can I like squee? I'm going <laughs> to squee. He, and I wasn't sure. Like I really was. And I was like hoping, and I wasn't sure if he was going to be able to pull it off, but I'll be honest. Um, he, I feel like he was able to bring, cause he's an, I mean, he is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Like he's a phenomenal actor. And I felt like he was able to bring the same kind of things, even though he doesn't have the stature of Daniel Craig, he doesn't have that kind of bigger, you know, I feel like he still, he came across as more rough in, mm -hmm. in, in here and it, and it worked mm -hmm. and it totally worked. It was almost like. Daniel Craig in the movie was relying more, literally relying on just the fact that he was kind of physically bigger, but like James McAvoy, like just stormed through rooms and like demanded things. And it was, I thought he was fantastic. I, and, I totally agree. Yeah. The, his, uh, his presentation too. It's so, mm -hmm. he's got so much gravitas in that scene. He yep. really does. There's a, he, he sold it for me when Ren was trying to, um, to tell about the Tokai, Tokai. and uh, he told him he needed to, you know, how there are only 36 bottles, three dozen of the six dozen of these, these, these left. And uh, he turns and says something to him. And there's this feral look in his, in his eye and in his teeth. And mm -hmm. then um, Stelmaria starts to growl at Ren and scares him off. But it's, uh, it, it's McAvoy's face that sold it for me that, oh yeah, that's Azrael. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. like that. That's a guy who is on his uh, in his off time is building a giant fortress someplace. <laughs> yeah, he he's heading down a path already. Yeah, but yeah. still, the question with funding, like, why does he need to get funding? Totally, <laughs> he, he, still <laughs> totally. Seems, he still seems way too powerful to need funding. <laughs> but unless it's that, just a cover, where he, where he says, uh, you know, uh, who's against me? I love because that. Because just assumed the room is with him. So he's calling out who's against me. Yes. That, that was, was so that was hardcore. I love that. That was so great. Uh -huh. That was so great. And it almost felt like he was not necessarily, he was asking for funding, but like he's deliberately saying things like, yeah, I told you I was going here, but I was doing this thing and now I'm going to keep doing this thing. Like it was almost like he was, had that meeting and was saying it. I, it was just a way of, of control. I mean, it was just the control he had over that room. I can't even like yeah. fathom, well, you know, so he wasn't, he wasn't really asking for funding. He was telling them, I need more. You're going to give it to me. Withdrawal. Yeah. I just need you to like, can I have it? And I've got to go. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. When he shows the photogram of the city in the sky, uh -huh. there's a great shot of Lyra's eye. And like just widening and you can see it just through that slit that she's peeking through and you see the photogram and it comes back, cuts back to her. And also McAvoy looks to her a few times uh -huh. was, and there's a little, there's a lot of interplay between like who, who he knows she's seeing what she's seeing uh, all while the scene is just barreling along, you know, uh -huh. there's some really nice cinematography in that scene in a very dark room, you know, very nice cinematography. Mm -hmm. And I like the photogram stuff was, was great. Um, I like the way that looked. I like the instrument that he had that was kind of like the prop was very cool that he was using. I, I appreciated that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, one thing, Travis and I were talking um, earlier about how we really appreciated this, the kinder side of Azrael that we're seeing, the, 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 the side that does care about Lyra, which is what struck both of us seemed to be exactly the same way, is when he carries her to bed. Mm -hmm. Um which I thought was sweet in a way. Um, even as hard as he is on her, there's still some, he does care about her. There's something going on. And then I especially liked when he put her into the bed backwards and moves the pillow to the other side. And then she wakes up. He's like, Oh, of course you woke up now after he's carried her all the way right. up the steps and said, he covers her with the blanket. I really liked that little interplay there and her room. We get to see a little bit of her world where, where she's, made the arctic out of the peeling paint on her wall i love that ah, so great the that north so cool her attachment to it is palpable yeah and i think it's just about that scene i think what makes it so believable that he cares about her is that moments earlier he totally forgot she was in the room mm -hmm. i know that sounds weird <laughs> yeah but totally. he was 
he was so into his thing. And then still Mario is like uh, the girl. And he's like, what? Oh, yeah. Oh, right. You know, and but it doesn't mean he didn't care about her. He, you know, I, it, 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 he, he's so passionate about what he's doing and mm -hmm. he got wrapped up in it. Mm -hmm. um, and she's kind of, you know, that tenacious child that's like infuriating, but he loves her. Oh, yeah. And, and that was such a sweet Thing. I love when she asks to see the head and his no is like perfect. He's like, <laughs> no. no? <laughs> it's like, what it's like it why does great. she want to see the head? <laughs> but of perfect. course she does. Oh, this is the Lyra we love. Yeah. This is why we all love her. Yep. Well, what his I like answer. about the, um, when he, the way he put her down in the bed was that he then moved the pillow. Mm -hmm. He did that turn her. So what, what, it was very it was a very Osriel moment, right? Like he changed the world to fit what the, the his situation. He didn't change what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that was that was so neat and so like spot on for the character. All right. Uh the hunt for um Billy, uh we see a little bit of that and we see a meeting inside a warehouse where we see a lot of bird demons, by the way, up in the rafters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we get to see our first um, images of John Fah and Farter Quorum. Mm -hmm. Nice and early. We see him in the first episode. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I really like um, uh, James Cosmo as a uh, Farter Quorum with just the big bushy beard and the, and the deep voice and the stocky build. But um, John Fa was, uh, I, I love his accent and his delivery. He's smaller, but in some, way, some ways more powerful in a way. There's something about he has this compact power. Uh, the actor's Lucien Masmati. Um, I really like that characterization. Of the, he, he doesn't say much in this, but he, he's clearly in charge. Mm -hmm. uh, so it'll be fun to see their dynamic as we move further into the story. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and part of Corum was... Whereas in the in the movie, I felt like he was just so much of a more mild version that even though he's older, he was and 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 this one, he, you know, he could he has life, he has all these things. He but he's just older, and it was a great it was a great representation of him. I love the way that he went he bantered off with John Fa, like even though he's older. You're right. Mm -hmm. I don't know that man. I don't know how to even explain the command he had. But it was he, totally. He has a stillness. He's super still. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. it's something like, and people, he's the center of attention in all that big room full of people. Uh, he, and yeah, he's, it's, it was, it's something about it. Um, I don't know if you picked up on it on multiple viewing, but I'm looking forward to watching it again and really see how he moves around that room. Um, but yeah, the, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more of the Egyptians. I, I'm liking, I'm really liking the Egyptians in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Farter Corum gives me this whole like, and it's probably because I've been reading the comics, but um, like this old Thor look, you know, yeah, like yeah. big, burly, almost Santa Claus type, but uh, but just filled with like an old power. I just really neat, really yeah. neat. You yeah. can see him with uh, a Serafina Pecola mm -hmm. 50 right. years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I think what I liked most, and I'll, and I'll make it short, is just that Farda Corum and John Fah weren't caricatures. Mm -hmm. Like they were very real feeling mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, and, and other, other times we've seen these characters, they felt lots of things felt caricatured and these, this did not, this felt like, yeah, heck yeah. You're John Fah. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, let's talk about Azriel's departure. This part was maybe one that stood out to me a little bit with some weird, there's something weird about it. Uh, so Roger, as he's leaving, he, he Lyra Lyra's really upset, obviously, because he's not taking her with him. And you there's a real sense that he doesn't want to take her because it's dangerous, but also I think maybe he knows what he's got to do and he doesn't mm -hmm. want her to be there. But she runs off and then Roger yells, you know, you don't know her, she's special, which is it kind of strange. Mm -hmm. Uh for him to yell that to Azrael. A little mm -hmm. boy, you know, a, a kitchen boy. Mm -hmm. But then he yells back, I'll, I'll, equally strangely, um, <laughs> we're all special. Is that Everybody's what he says? Special. Everyone's special. Everyone's, Everyone's special. special. <laughs> uh, all I thought was syndrome. 
and you know right. if everyone's special nobody's i nobody's. love that yes it was like this is the conversation in the car with dash and his mom yep. when everybody's special no one's special yep. was, i don't know it, it 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 hit me a little tin-eared like i was like shaking my ear like hmm that's i don't know i, I didn't i didn't buy that part yeah it was it was kind of like they were uh, shouting out uh, you know this is Ariel's Azrael's theme you know mm-hmm. everyone's special they don't they're we don't have to worry about you know gods and all that other stuff it's just everyone is yeah mm-hmm. yeah we'll see where that goes I'm not sure if that's that was just some dramatic moment that they played up but it struck me a little bit off. I will yeah. say this though about Roger and this is just kind of an overarching little comment I I really like his character and the development of his character so far like in in the book when i read it he's a little he, he's and in the movie too that like he's so he's fawning over lyra mm-hmm. um and in here he's not like she still obviously has i mean he's her servant he brings her breakfast in the show mm-hmm. but they're a little bit more equal yeah. than it felt in the book and in the movie like he kind of he's like whatever but i'm gonna tell you like he, you know he kind of banters with her and he has more of a of a presence that i like yeah i liked it because i always felt like that's what she would need she she wouldn't want some a pushover mm-hmm. like she, you know she needs that push back and and this character gave it to her and i appreciated mm-hmm. that almost like a yeah. sibling in a way like he's yeah. playing playing more of a sibling role than a friend role or or a, or a close sibling mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah uh my my lily when when we were watching just remarked about how blunt he was with her is there's a part where um you know how she's like how are we going to get to the north i got to get to the north and he's like uh you know we're orphans and we've got, and we're broke you know there's no <laughs> yeah, way right we're getting to the north with a mouthful of sausage <laughs> exactly <laughs> uh, yeah okay can i move us forward yes please can we talk about the introduction to the Magisterium. Yes. yes and Lord course. Boreal. Lord Boreal. Early. Early <laughs> Lord Boreal. Ooh, yes, it was. Young, handsome, young uh, yes, Lord Boreal. Yes, he was. If he's, and 40, I was, oh, he's barely I'm, 40. I'm here for it. I'm totally here for it. <laughs> I don't, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I don't like that Lord Boreal looks younger than me. Like, that's weird, right? I, I like I, it. I, well, I, you, I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, not just because he's a very handsome man. <laughs> I like it because I know that in the book he's older and powerful, but I but I feel like at some point, like Mrs. Coulter, like he's past his point of moving forward. This younger Lord Boreal, it, it makes sense to me that Mrs. Coulter would now be in a relationship with him would kind of be dealing with him in an, in a way like he's, he, he could still be going places. And I like that they took him to a younger spot to, for that reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, his conversation with the high priest or whatever, you can tell that he's on the move. Like he's important. Mm-hmm. He is be, he's been given a task that is incredibly important. He's trusted. Um, he's probably cunning. Um, I mean, you know, he's got a snake demon. Come on, you know, right. you, you know that he's got something up his sleeve. A snake. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, a surprise, <laughs> it's a snake. <laughs> uh, but I, I think fast forwarding into the stuff we just read in The Subtle Knife, I'm this that with this guy, mm. that stuff is going to be really electric. I think mm-hmm. the yeah. stuff with him in our world, I think that's going to be really good. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, quick note: uh, the guy who played the high priest is uh, Daphne Keene's dad. What? Is it really? It is. That's interesting. Lord Boreal's uh, the actor's name is Arian Bakari. Great name too. I will remember that name. Hang on, let me see. <laughs> let me see how old he is. Travis, stand by. <laughs> I'll get it in a second. <laughs> I, uh, I hope I hope he's less than forty-four. <laughs> he needs to be less than forty-four. I know, please be more than forty-four. Oh my god! Thank, thank God he was born in nineteen seventy-one. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yes. <laughs> Woo! He's very little older than me. Okay. He's forty. He's forty-eight. Well, Hollywood uh, years changing, so you know. The other so, part I love about this scene, very quickly, is the magisterium again. Instead of being a caricature. 
It's very subtle. It kind of pulls back into this galactic empire, Mega like Church. Senate. It's, Ma- it's it's Joel Osteen. <laughs> <laughs> but it you know it, it yeah it so it doesn't have that look of like you know of like this medieval cathedral and they're all right. walking around. It is so much more clean and crisp and political, and this I is loved a it. Current. This yes. is not the Catholic Church yes. that's been around for. This is a vibrant, powerful. Mm-hmm current church structure that is continuing to thrive and expand and it is um there's no rival to it it's not like oh there's five other religions and you can choose whatever you want this is clearly they want to remain number one they're very careful they have and and part of it is being attractive you want to attract people yeah. And I know that in the book, we were always like, well, who is the magisterium? Why are they a threat? We don't really know anything about them. And what I liked about this was we still don't know very much about them, but they felt threatening. Mm-hmm. Like, like what, like, it, you know what I mean? Like there was a, 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 a real sense of like, just enough menace, just enough, you know, um, that didn't feel hokey. It didn't feel forced. It was like, you know, from what I can see so far, I'm like, ooh, that's not a, you're bad. Yeah. yeah, and that's what I didn't get from about some of the uh, online uh, conversations and some of the complaints that I saw um, and some of the reviews were that um, the magisterium was still too amorphous. And, you know, first episode, firstly. It's 56 minutes into the show and people are already talking about this mess. Yes. R- like Rolling Stone complained about it. And, uh, you know, again, like you said, it, it, first episode. Stop whining. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you know, I felt like the menace was there in Mm -hmm. every conversation where they were mentioned. I mean, the the scholars were terrified. Mm -hmm. I mean, we heard them talk about the heresy and everything. Clearly, this is a a totalitarian type church. You know, I mean, I don't know why people were complaining. It was pretty clear to me what was going on. It's more clear than the book. Yeah. Oh, say, so, yeah. I mean, if, if you're going to be nitpicking this show, it's like the book leaves it so far out there. You you mm-hmm. get very little one on one with what's happening with the magisterium, just secondhand. And you certainly it, it also still establishes them as being menacing and and people are afraid of them. But now we're getting to, like, see plans in action. We're getting to see their world. And even as as subtle as that was. Um, they're not hitting us over the head with it, but we're certainly seeing that that's, they're a force to be reckoned with. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, how about the introduction of, um, Mrs. Coulter? So awesome. Ruth Wilson. Mm -hmm. So awesome. I had doubts about her. I really did. When, you know, watching some of the trailers, I felt like it looked like she was like chewing scenery, but, um, the way she just held her head Mm -hmm. and her voice, she was as soon as I heard her, she was Mrs. Holter to me. Mm-hmm. Like, I, yeah. And, and when she did walk in the dining room, uh, I know we said before that the Oxford didn't look like Hogwarts, mm-hmm. but I mean that was Hogwarts. That was Hogwarts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. how, about, how about that they're in, they're in the middle of the blessing when she walks in and mm-hmm. she doesn't partake of the blessing. She never stops walking. They all are seated as she's walking up on the dais. It's like sh- that's. Mrs. Coulter. And it's like, I don't need to stop her, for this. Watch like the guy's heads as they all turn and they're looking at her and everything. Yes. She's tempting them as she goes through. I mean, like, and it, she it, knew it. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She knew it because when, when she's walking through the door and the, and the, she is, she is just kind of side eyeing everyone and smiling like, yep. yep. Like she knew. And, and then she does exactly what Mrs. Coulter would do, which is she gets up there and he's like, this is Lyra. And she was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. You're going to have to help me. Yeah. Which like fork she, do I use again? Yep. Yeah, that was it. It sucks Lyra right in. It yep. does. And it's not like Lyra probably doesn't even know which fork to use on it. Let's be honest. <laughs> That's right. But <laughs> she's still totally sucked in. That, oh, maybe I can, you know, she's mm-hmm. asking me to say something. And poor Roger trying to Aww. get her attention while he's filling her water. Ugh. <laughs> Forgotten. So sad. Yeah. Poor guy. I just saw somebody posted a a meme. Uh, There's a His Dark Materials meme um, account on Twitter that had uh, 
the the standard guy turning around looking at the girl and in this case the guy was lyra <laughs> mrs coulter was walking away and roger was the, shot, roger was the, the upset the, girlfriend yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and right away and she doesn't even blink she never even looks at him he just has to sort of shuffle up he even tries to sort of he stands between her and mrs coulter for, for like you know a second but just long enough to be like this is a poor kid yeah, super awkward. <laughs> super awkward. Uh, so there, um, she's very playful with Lyra in this scene, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, you were talking about her being like over the top. You know, we we're worried about her maybe chewing scenery and being over the top, and we may still get plenty of that. But there's a lightness to this these early scenes, and you need it in order for Lyra to be taken with her. Yeah, you know, and and when she reveals that she needs an assistant. Lyra needs to be excited about this yeah. and, and be pretty thrilled by it. But this, a, a very subtle change, which I kind of liked is she says, can Roger come with us? That set, yeah. that changed the entire tone of Lyra leaving. Yes. It fixed the whole thing for me in a good way. Yeah, right? absolutely. My it kids, works in the book, but it works. It works. This is really solid change. Yeah. Cause in the book, I mean, they have to uh, get into Lyra's thoughts to explain why she's okay with just leaving Roger. Mm-hmm. And here we've got an on-screen sort of mystery. I mean, we there, there's no question for us. We know what happened to Roger. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mrs. Coulter knows what happened to Roger. The only one who doesn't know what happened to Roger is Lyra. Right. But uh, that mystery is what's going to pull Lyra into that story. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's I, I thought it was really well done. As, as soon as she agrees to take him, I was like, well, she's going to snatch him. <laughs> like, yeah. this is all makes sense now, in a way, yep. you know? Yep. Uh, Joanna, uh, Joanna, do you have something to add? Oh, I was just, I, I was just thinking um, that at, it also makes Lyra more sympathetic. Because in the book, or empathetic, for, in the book, she totally just forgets him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's kind of like, I'm not going to swear, but that's like a crap move. Mm-hmm. You know, like, come on, Lyra, like, that's terrible. And this gives her, you know, because the reason she goes then is like, well, she's our best way of finding Roger. And I think she was convincing herself that that was why she wanted to go. I'm not sure if she re- like how she I think she meant it 50 percent. And I think the other 50 percent was convincing her that that's why, she, you know, she wanted to go. And she yeah. was trying to give herself an out. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. she says, you know, she believes her that the gobblers exist. She says the gobblers are probably based in London because that would make sense if they're moving kids around and she has connections. Like, I, w- I bought it. I'm like, well, yeah. And she's right because she is the gobbler. <laughs> it's like, yeah. of course right. she's right. And she's literally telling her her secret. But the way she took Lyra into her confidence, she pulled her to the side and let's move away so no one can hear us. Mm-hmm. I mean, she knew exactly how to make, make Lyra feel important and want her she's to come old. along. She's 12 years old. I mean, yeah. you, you, you never forget that she's just a kid. Yeah, but I mean, that's what Mrs. Coulter does. Mm -hmm. She does that to everyone. She knows exactly how to make everyone feel like they need to do what she wants. Mm -hmm. Um, Golden Monkey, what do we think? There was one shot, and I don't want to jump ahead. We're going to have to jump ahead anyway. But in the Zeppelin, when Lyra finally gets on the Zeppelin and sits across, and it's just sitting there like still and staring daggers Mm -hmm. into them, Mm -hmm. I was like, yee. Yeah. That was that that monkey does not get better no matter the media. No. And you know the I watched a video of some arctic monkeys like fighting earlier in the week. Mm-hmm. They were like relaxing and then they got mad and they all went crazy and attacked each other. And um they look a little bit like this, you know, this monkey. And it's like, oh man, this this monkey could snap at any moment. Ugh. It just like it just wants to bite them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's so <laughs> mean. Uh, so the lithiometer handoff. Very quick. Yeah. Um, just like it is in the book. And you, you, I think we spent probably more time talking about that scene on the podcast than the actual part of the book, which I think it was like a page and a half. Mm-hmm. He's like, here, take this. You should have it and hide it. But he uses the same. Joanne, he uses the part that you liked. Um, what do you say? Keep it in your. What, what does he say? What is the he line? Says, he said, keep your own counsel. Keep your own counsel. I loved which it. You loved, which I, you did. Loved. I, I did. I yeah. did. It the was the exact such a, same way. It was such a trust in her. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, it was, it was pure trust. Like, I know like you, you are going to be the, your, your best ally here. She doesn't, she doesn't want to take it. I mean, like she right. really does refuse it. And that was a believable refusal too. Mm-hmm. Lyra's like, 
no, I, well, I don't come on. And she's like, um, the design of it's interesting. It's square. It is square. It's a circle in a square. I mean, a circle in a square, but you know, circle gets the square. Um, I like it's, it. I like it too. I, th- I think it's mm-hmm. fine. I like the I like the subtle change. It also um, I like I like how it fits into the little sleeve nicely mm-hmm. with that, and it just I don't know, there's something really nice about it. Um, it's interesting to me about the alethiometer is that they're um, earlier in in the episode. I don't exactly remember when, but he's got a book open with next to the alethiometer, yeah. and he's studying the, the dork that I am. I I paused and got close to it and 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 looked at it, and um, it's a it's a description of all of the symbols. Mm-hmm. You know, he could have been a, a pal and kind of, you know, pulled the page out and folded it, sent it with to, with Lyra so she'd have uh, some kind of idea of, you know, what these things mean. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 feel like, I don't know. I felt like the, the master could have done better by right. Lyra. <laughs> and and you, then her first attempt is, where's uh, Roger? Yes. <laughs> like she like talks to it. Like, She's like, hello, Show computer. Me you... <laughs> yeah. Hello, computer. I yeah. felt like you know, like it's like a like a boomer trying to use like the very you know, like how do I use this thing? And we're just like, hello, and you're like, oh my god, that was great. Actually, it I really like so, that. It was. It was a ador- It was adorable. It was so cute. She gives it the real college try. She tries it like four times, and then she pretty much thinks it's useless after that. I, I'm surprised she didn't just throw it away. I know. I thought she was going to throw it down. She leaves without packing, right? I don't. She didn't take anything with her. She just bolted with I'm the. Not sure all she, she has it. Yeah, I don't think I, I think that might be all she actually has. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. She's just it's just hand me down ill fitting clothes, yeah. you know, that yeah. she wears. Yeah. Um, that's that are mended over and over and over again. Again, another kind of believable element. Mm-hmm. Um, but she almost doesn't make the Zeppelin, but she does get she does get there, but just mm-hmm. barely. And that's when we get to see the the stare down by the uh, the gold monkey. Um and then we look out the window and she's on her way out of Oxford. Lyra's yeah. Oxford, the first episode comes to a close. She sees the Egyptians also sit, setting sail for London. She looks down on them. Yeah, that little canal. I love mm-hmm. that shot. That yeah. was just as I pictured it, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I did want to sort of briefly mention in the little teaser that says, like, in the weeks ahead on his dark materials, there's a sequence where she's walking in, Bal- uh, in um, Svalbard that I thought looked awesome. And I was like, squee! <laughs> is that the bit with the bones over the steps yes yes oh so cool yeah cannot yeah. wait cannot wait for real yeah though i kind of think that uh this whole episode i loved it and uh it was edited almost uh identically to our first episode and i'm thinking that maybe the, they're what listening to us <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah. If, if you haven't listened to our first episode, this is your first episode. First of all, spo- uh, retroactive spoiler alert. But uh, yeah, uh, episode one one is going to be all about this first uh, television episode. Yeah. Yep. It probably won't always be that way, but um, certainly for this time it did, because I believe it did close with her leaving and heading to London. Yep. Mm-hmm. It was a compact episode, but but just like when we recorded, I remember, I think Travis's first uh, line in that podcast was like, this was big <laughs> because we read, <laughs> we read three chapters. Remember that was the only time we read three chapters Yes, and it was a lot of meat. We had to get through a lot of stuff in that first, that the world building, they fit all that into this one episode. They um, did. I was talking to Jack and we were reading the book a little bit earlier this evening and it was four whole chapters of the book. Like mm-hmm. I showed him, we read the first chapter, but mm-hmm. it's chapters one through four. Oh, wow. At the at the end beyond. of chapter four is when she meets Mrs. Coulter at the at the dinner. Okay. And so it might even have gone a little, you know, it, it goes kind of a little bit into into five. So it was a lot. It was a lot to put in a first episode for sure. Yeah. But it fit. But, yeah, it didn't feel rushed. It, nope. It did not. Oh. Yeah, I felt like everything was paced in a way and i feel like i I, i'm i'm so excited for the next episode i i cannot even wait yeah i had one quick thought to add um which is just sort of an overarching thing is lots of demon talking in this Uh oh yeah demon chit-chatting and talking and stel (laughs) stelmaria talks more in this episode than she talks in the entire book series um just just up on that it just just in the arctic you know just in the north um 
but Pan is real talkative. Of course, he's he is really talkative. But lots of little voices and lots of speaking. And um, uh, the Costa boys uh, uh, hawk talks, and you get to hear a lot mm-hmm. of words from the from the demons. I thought they were pretty successfully done too. And uh, they they didn't do a lot of the transformations. The the movie played up the live transformations a lot with Pan. This very subtle, a couple times to a bird, to another thing, to another thing, but not like constantly shifting. Yeah. We did get to see him as the moth, like uh, yes. <laughs> that was, which is great in the dust, which was really cute. Uh, but I think it's, I think it's fine. I think it's good. Yeah, I like the swirly effect when he changes. Yeah, it's like, whoosh, yeah, yeah, right. They yeah. even talk about demon death and human death in this first yep. episode. They got that in there too. Yeah. yeah. Why did Why did demons disappear when they and did, we when turned to bones? Sex? Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And it was perfectly natural. It's and that's what I love. It was it was it was not forced. It was not spoon fed. It was just this wonderfully natural exposition that felt like I'm just watching the story and it was it was great. Yeah. You know? yeah. It wasn't an info dump in the sense that like someone says, you know, what happens to demons when they die? And then someone says, They turn to die. And then either it was just mm-hmm. very they were in the crypt. Of course, it's a natural yeah. thing to ask. Why yeah. do we end up like this? And why do the demons get to die in the way they do which i think with is preferential maybe they he likes it better yeah um yeah solid stuff good stuff good start can't wait for next week and our 30 minute episode has just hit its 60th minute (laughs) (laughs) oh no we are yappy we need to get better at this uh well we appreciate you guys listening we're very excited i can't believe we're actually here talking about this show finally yeah Yes. Yeah. When we started doing this and we said that we were going to, uh, you know, we're going to read the books and then we're going to get to the show. You know, I I mean, I I figured we were going to do it, but we're doing it. This is pretty fun. Fully committed. Yeah. Yep. All in. Uh, Well, have a pleasant evening. Please, um, please email us at feedback at the Amber Spycast.com. We would love to talk about the show with you guys Uh, or follow us on Twitter or um, like us on Instagram or check us out on our page on Facebook. We've had a bunch of people, uh, you know, on Twitter engaging with us the past few days, mm. and it's been pretty fun. A lot of them are, uh, you know, our other our fellow podcasters, which um, we love, which we absolutely love. Um, some these these folks are fun, and uh, it's nice to be part of uh, the the His Dark Materials podcasting community now. The family of podcasters, you know, we really would like, I mean, if they're, if we all listen to each other's podcasts, but if they're, if they're listening to this one, um, I think it'd be fun to get a podcasting round table going. I think Travis had mentioned trying to get a little, a uh, go group effort where we get to chit chat and talk about the things we like and, we did. and uh, meet own, each other. Yeah. Our own little roping. <gasps> oh, that's what we'll call it. The roping. That'll be a special I episode. I like it. Halfway through, we'll do it. I love it. Uh, All right, kitties. Thanks for listening. It's been fun. Have a good one. Good night.